Uh, I'm uh, Martin Flaherty. I'm a professor here, um, teach uh, constitutional law, human rights. I'm the uh, co-director of the Leitner Center. Um, and I'm particularly uh, excited about being able to moderate this panel, which will uh, go to a uh, comparison of uh, US and European uh, law with regard to hate speech. Um, and much hangs in the balance because I'm a citizen both of the United States and the Republic of Ireland, which may, means I'm also a citizen of the EU. So depending on which presentation is more convincing, that's the passport I will use from now on. Um, I want to just frame the discussion with a bit of what the contrast is commonly understood to be. So let me start not with a European document, but with a document that tends to reflect, uh, or is usually understood to reflect, what much of the, West of the rest of the world, including Europe, views with regard to hate speech, and that's Article 20 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and it says, any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred constitutes incitement to discrimination, that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. So international human rights law not only um, does not protect hate speech, it puts states under an injunction to prohibit hate speech. By contrast, when the United States acceded to the uh, ICCPR, its very first reservation was to Article 20. Uh, the Senate said, we will not join this treaty unless uh, it is understood that Article 20 does not authorize or require legislation or any other action by the United States that would restrict the right of free speech and association protected by the Constitution and laws of the United States. Now, to explore this apparent contrast and to examine how apparent or real that contrast is, we have two wonderful panelists. Um, our first speaker, and I'm just going to leave most of their bios um, to you in the program. But our first speaker will be uh, Professor Nico Van Eck, uh, who is uh, a professor of media and telecommunications law and director of the Institute uh, for Information Law at the University of uh, Amsterdam. And uh, our next spe our speaker after that, uh, looking at the US side, will be uh, Carrie Dessel, who is a staff attorney for the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Um, so let's begin with uh, a look at uh, EU law with Professor Bonnet. Thank you very much. Um, and also to be brief on my CV so I can add a few things. Um, I'm a former radio pirate. Uh, <laughs> I love Game of Thrones. Uh, and I hardly ever read books, but that's only to challenge people to watch more television and to watch in interesting television series who sometimes better depict the, the, the reality than uh, reading books. And uh, I think Game of Thrones is the ultimate example of the crisis that we have in Europe, because you're all familiar... Uh, 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 sorry, maybe it's politically incorrect, again, to, to, to use Game of Thrones. You don't watch it, I assume, because you're all Thank academics. You. Uh, but, but it's something about seven kingdoms who uh, fight against each other, and they totally forget that there is an outside border, which is far more important, and they have this understaffed night watch trying to protect them from the outside danger. I think that's sometimes also what's happening in the European Union. We are focusing far too much on the problems within the European Union, and we totally forget that we should protect our outside borders or that we have very strong outside borders that we can use to better negotiate deals. When recently uh, there was the announcement that Apple was bringing back 34 billion, I think, from its offshore money to the American economy, I expected the president of the European Union to stand up uh, and say, and now what about the money that you offshored from Europe? Uh, hasn't happened yet, but maybe it will. Uh, often when, how do I deal with the slides? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's only four of them, so, so it's a... <laughs> oh, you can give me the remote. Okay, so this is often the picture we see when we talk about Europe. This is a painting uh, of the famous Pandora's box, and uh, you're probably familiar with this box. It's a box that was not supposed to be opened by Pandora, but she uh, couldn't uh, fight her curiosity, and she opened the box, and the box was full of evils. That's my next slide. So uh, 
when I'm in international discussions, these are amongst the evils that we have in, in Europe. The, f the most recent one is the creation of a European high-level group to investigate fake news. I'm very positive about the outcome. Uh, the person chairing it is a former student of us. Uh, and I full faith that that will not result in a similar thing as what happened three years ago, four years ago, when there was another high-level group in 2013 on media pluralism and freedom. And although this group also had very interesting recommendations, it also uh, promoted the idea of media councils who could, uh, uh, who could then uh, control journalists and could even find them. Uh, and uh, thanks to a lot of opposition, that idea of went where it belonged in a bottom drawer, uh, never to be opened again. Um, the other thing also very recently is the, uh, what some people call the EU Truth Police. The European Commission has put together a group of 13, 15 experts. Nobody knows who these people are. And they do fact checking, in particular uh, on uh, information that uh, comes from Russia or is about uh, Russia. And uh, it, they have been looking into thousands of cases. Most of those cases are typical Russian cases. So Russians misinform Russians. That's no big surprise. Uh, I have no idea why Europe should be looking into that. But they also came to the conclusion that the uh, regional newspaper in Gelderland, which is a small province in the Netherlands, uh, was part of the Russian conspiracy because they quoted a Russian official of the company that prepared the famous uh, missiles that were probably the cause of uh, the MH17 plane to, to crash and, um, and, and have an, a, an enormous amount of casualties in it. Uh, among one, uh, the family of a friend of mine who was a lawyer at a law firm. Um, so th this, was, this was correct journalism, but it was a quote of this person, and this person was considered to be unreliable, and therefore the article was considered to be unreliable, therefore the newspaper was considered to be unreliable, and therefore it ended up in this list. Without having the newspaper given the opportunity to react on it, it's an operation of one million euros, which in my view is almost disqualifying it, uh, besides the fact that it's run by uh, by a government agency, and I don't think this is the kind of stuff that should be done by governmental agencies. Uh, there is the, uh, not to be called very successful, code of conduct for social platforms that Facebook, Google, and others were forced into this agreement uh, two years ago. And uh, you have all heard about recent developments in Germany where they, uh, and this is so, I love the German language. I mean, nobody can create a word like this. I mean, uh, let me give it a try. Net durchsetzungsgesetz. That's pretty much OK. I, I sometimes have to speak in Germany, and then I ask them, should I speak in German or should I speak in English? If I start to talk in German, you will have a lot of fun. If I talk in English, you probably might better understand what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a beautiful law. Uh, like all German laws are, are extremely beautiful from a technical point of view. The content is more debatable, and I'll get back to that in a, in a second. In France, there was the announcement by the French president about uh, having uh, a limitation on free speech uh, in election time uh, in order to uh, avoid last-minute uh, gossip and confrontation, as some of you might know. Uh, just before the, uh, the, the final elections in France, where Macron became a president, uh, he was made part of the famous Pizza Gate uh, uh, conspiracy. And uh, the jury is still out what kind of effect that had. And I think that's maybe something we also should discuss, also listening to the previous panel. Uh, there is a lot of concern, but how much empirical evidence do we actually have that these concerns have resulted in, in, in true damage, in, in true uh, uh, negative consequences. So in this Pandora box, when all the evils are out, there is also this other thing. There is hope. There is hope. Uh, and, and I don't know whether there's real hope, because it seems that in hope, uh, Bill Clinton was born. Uh, that's at least what Wikipedia says, but who trusts Wikipedia? Um, so there is hope. Next slide. So there is hope. 
First of all, uh, we do things very thoroughly, so it takes a lot of time to come up with new legislation, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, it takes four to six years, sometimes eight years, before uh, we have new rules and before they start to be implemented and before courts might have a look at it. So there is a kind of mitigating uh, thing when it comes to issues that we think are very important today, but where maybe tomorrow it will be of less importance. Uh, I had a professor in communications law, uh, in communication science. I only uh, attended two lectures, uh, but I still remember that, that he said, the newspaper of today is tomorrow used to pack the fish. Um, so have a broader perspective. The uh, other thing I think that's very important, and you're all familiar with the saying, uh, uh, what happens in Vegas should stay in Vegas. Mm -hmm. What happens in Germany should sometimes stay in Germany. What happens in France should sometimes stay in France. There is a, uh, there is a kind of a weird tendency that I have noticed that uh, when it fits, you just use foreign examples, and when it doesn't fit, you tell that these are wrong, but there's often a far more broader context. In Germany, they have also other laws which might be considered also to be wrong from an international perspective, but that do fit in a German discussion. Uh, doesn't mean that Germans are happy with it. There's also a very strong opposition against this law for various reasons, and uh, uh, maybe we can discuss them later. France, same. France has a long tradition of uh, uh, limiting uh, free speech uh, in a, an election environment. It's one of the few countries in Europe that has still very, very strict rules about uh, whether or not you can uh, report uh, about the... Uh, uh, the polls, uh, and actually a week or two weeks before the election, there is, it's not allowed to have public reporting on polls. Uh, France is also the country where the media regulator counts every second of speech by political parties to see that everyone has the same amount of access to the media. It even goes so far that if a partner of a politician is participating in a cooking program, that is also taken into account, not for a full credit, but like a half credit or a quarter credit. And I have to say, it's, it's a great way to create jobs in a country that has too few jobs at the moment. Um, the biggest, the biggest um, I think, the, and, and that's why I called my, my, uh, uh, my presentation, uh, I included the, the notion of square wheels. What happens a lot is that we are going to a cycle of re-experiencing things that have already happened in the past. And we have to be very, very careful that we don't come up with the wrong solutions. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the, the problems that are being discussed in Europe and the solutions that are being men mentioned are not appropriate. And that's why we, we should more uh, rely, and we're actually also doing so, rely on, for example, uh, balancing powers as uh, visible in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and the Court in Luxembourg, which is the European Union Court, they have a long tradition, particularly the court in, in Strasbourg, of dealing with misleading information, with what some people call fake information, with journalistic responsibilities, and uh, also is, is developing new case law on how to deal with social networks and with social platforms, and is uh, very cautious about putting too much responsibility at the wrong spot. Uh, still a learning curve, but I think that's where we should go for. And this is my last and always last slide. Um, I'm uh, very much, very much supporting what Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you're going, be very careful because you might not get there. And I think that's wise advice to every regulator in Europe, but also wise advice to students and wise advice to all of us. Thank you. Great, and now we'll hear from Carrie DeSalle. Um, so I, um, I'm a staff attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia, where we have been focusing on defending and expanding First Amendment rights in the digital age, uh, primarily through impact litigation, but also through public education campaigns uh, and an independent research program that we've uh, initiated this past fall. Uh, one of the big cases that we're working on right now is a constitutional claim against President Trump and his White House staffers who have blocked critics from his Twitter feed. And we, in that case, have alleged that his Twitter feed constitutes a public forum and 
there seems to be a broadening agreement about the nature of these social media platforms as effectively occupying the space of public discourse in the digital age. And so the, uh, the extent of the government's ability to regulate in these spaces is becoming increasingly important because it basically goes to the heart of what our concept of American democracy really is. It's a democracy premised on a wide open, uninhibited debate about public policy ends. Um, and so I kind of with that lead and I think the topic of this panel, um, regulation of hate speech in social media, encompasses the overlap between two very large, very complex issues. The first is regulation of hate speech under the First Amendment in the United States. Um, regulation of hate speech is effectively prohibited except in the rarest instances when hate speech amounts to uh, an actual incitement to violence or a true threat um, where there's real evidence of an intent to threaten bodily harm on a particular individual or group of individuals. Um, the second very complex issue in the United States is the regulation of social media companies. The United States uh, has taken kind of an anti-regulatory approach to internet platforms in general. The Communications Decency Act was referenced in the first panel. Section 230 of that act um, basically says that the government is going to take a hands-off approach and not only that, but protect internet companies from civil liability for uh, content that third parties post on their websites. Um, the language of the statute states that these companies are not going to be treated as publishers in the traditional sense of this third party content. So they basically bear no responsibility for what's posted on their platforms within the United States regulatory framework. It's very different in Europe, um, as I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more. But I think the contrast between Article 20 that Professor Flaherty pointed out and <laughs> Sorry, that was an attempt to uh, <laughs> combine the Irish pronunciation and the English pronunciation or American <laughs> pronunciation of <laughs> your names, and I totally botched it. But um, uh, the conflict between Article 20 and First Amendment theories in the United States really comes down to kind of a Madisonian vision of American democracy and of freedom of speech, in my view. Um, this vision of democracy relies on the ability of all participants in that democracy, of citizens, to express whatever their views are about matters of public concern and have those views heard first in uh, the public discourse and then have them acted on in the voting booth. The idea being that it's not a truly representative democracy if people are not given equal opportunity to share their views about matters of public concern. Um, this vision of the First Amendment and of American democracy, I think, comes into conflict with a kind of a competing, emerging vision that uh, legal academics and, um, and just public uh, opinion <laughs> uh, in general has formulated over recent years, and by recent years, I mean the past few decades, an idea that not only is uh, a democracy in and of itself and re representative democracy an end of the First Amendment, but so is democratic culture in a way. This is a term coined by Professor Jack Balkan. Um, the idea that everybody should have an equal opportunity to participate in the creation of popular culture basically and that our lives are dictated by much more than the public policy um, and legislative enactments handed down in Washington. Um, but that concept brings in some competing rights potentially, some um, affirmative rights to speak without intimidation, to speak on a platform where your basic human dignity and basic civic dignity is recognized. Um, and that potentially conflicts with the rights of hateful speakers. And so I think there are a host of questions about how you mediate public discourse in the digital age to maximize opportunities both for speakers but also listening opportunities and the speaker and the opportunities of would-be speakers who may otherwise be intimidated intimidated from participating in the discourse at large. So with that introduction of a few different things to consider, Great. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you both for your uh, interesting opening remarks. And let me ask a question that I hope it unites them um, that raises uh, uh, some contemporary problems. So uh, on the one hand, We've heard about the regulation of false news and potentially harmful and hateful uh, speech in the election context in particular in Europe. 
uh, and then also seeing, uh, being reminded about uh, uh, US values in that regard. So here's the sort of modern situation. I'd be interested in how uh, each speaker uh, uh, thinks their particular legal regimes would respond to it. Um, to show you I watch television, John Oliver, <laughs> recently noted that it's usually not a good thing when far-right parties gain the ascendancy in Europe. Uh, not a good historical track record there. Uh, conversely, in fact, you know, in parallel, uh, I saw on social media that there was someone running for the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania who's a Holocaust denier. So I'm thinking of Hungary, Poland on the Europe side, um, both in an election context and not in an election context where you have not only false news, but hateful news, and Holocaust denial, I think, combines both concepts, um, and this fellow you know, in Pennsylvania. So I'd be interested first in you know, the European response uh, uh, to that problem, uh, and then you know, what the, what the, how the US uh, current First Amendment jurisprudence and uh, scholarship uh, is considering a problem like that, so. <coughs> Um, yeah, uh, let me start by a disclaimer. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it's very complicated because you're touching upon something where you actually don't have, where well, you have, it's not a conflict, but in the European context of fundamental rights, and particular rights like freedom of expression, we do give a substantial margin of appreciation to individual states. Right because there are substantial differences among the states. As you're probably familiar, uh, we have uh, countries like France and Germany, because of their past, have very strict rules on, for example, Nazi paraphernalia, uh, on, even on, on eBay and on websites. Right. Other countries in Europe don't have that because they have a different background. And in Europe, fundamental rights are not absolute. There are limitations, and particular limitations that are linked to the contribution to uh, the rule of law that are linked to democracy, uh, which means, for example, in the jurisprudence of the court in Strasbourg, you cannot claim freedom of expression if you want to uh, annul freedom of expression. That's where there is a limitation in European jurisprudence. Um, and so when, when we are now discussing fake news uh, and, and your observation about John Oliver, I'm also a big fan of him. I'm, Besides having been a radio pirate, I was also studying uh, illegal downloading, and now I know how I can watch Donald Oliver the next day after he has been <laughs> on U.S. television, and I'm, I'm a big fan of him, real big fan. Uh, the, the, I, I think we should embrace these topics uh, in a much more broader context because it, this should not be a topic that is dominated by right-wing parties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel very uncomfortable that I sometimes have to make statements that are then repeated by some of the right-wing parties in Europe. Mm. Uh, and I wish there was more support uh, because it's not about the abuse uh, by right-wing parties, it's about freedom of expression, it's about democracy, and we should also make clear also to right-wing parties, and in a European context, that's because there is a different context, it is very well possible to say, you are not the owner of saying there should be free speech, mm -hmm. because you're proclaiming things that fall totally outside of the scope of free speech. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you're also stifling the public debate, uh, because although there might not be direct damage, there is definitely a chilling effect coming from the way how certain people treat their freedom of expression. Uh, and that's where we need to find new balances. And I think that one of the issues that we have to look into is we should not create government uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, we should not have uh, public organizations dealing with these issues, but we should have swift and workable solutions. The dynamics of society are different, uh, slightly different from what they were in the past, although, again, I, I do think that if we start to emphasize everything that happens on a daily basis, uh, that's not going to be helpful. Please wait a day or two days or three days and then the whole problem is off and gone. Uh, we, have to com we have to, I think self-restraint would not be so wrong. I mean, uh, we call all this stuff fake news and the next day we talk about other stuff. Uh, let's be more prudent, uh, but 
try to get into this broader context mode and then from the context mode try to find practical solutions that work. And a lot of the solutions that now have been mentioned in my view are not practical, they are square wheels. Mm -hmm. uh, they are based on often ideas like fake news is news I don't like. Well, so, sorry, uh, European Court in Strasbourg has said already 30 years ago that freedom of expression also includes the right to offend and shock. It's standard jurisprudence. and. Uh, let's please be a little bit more open to the fact that we are shocked from time to time and that we're challenged from time to time. I think um, in the US context, it's pretty straightforward. There's <laughs> pretty much nothing anyone could do to bar this person from running or from campaigning, um, you know, hateful policies. Um, it's comes down to one of the fundamental difficulties with this concept of kind of liberal neutrality that we embrace under First Amendment jurisprudence and freedom of speech, the idea that you should kind of maximize the opportunities for people to pursue their own concept of the good life and to share that and try to convince others that they should come along. Um, but then what happens when you are being asked to tolerate the intolerant among you? Is that um, not threatening to the overarching concept uh, under which you know we think that we're pursuing a, a kind of good liberal democratic rule. I think part of the solution, at least in American jurisprudence, is this bedrock um, commitment to really what's an empirical proposition, the idea that sunlight and counter speech are the best disinfectants to hateful speech. And so you have this person campaigning in Pennsylvania um, the idea being there should be plentiful opportunities for other members of his community, other members of the national community at large, to call attention to the false and hateful premises of this particular campaign and try to rally support for the opposing candidate and for opposing views in society. Um, I think you know this does get into some of the difficulties that the er earlier panel addressed about these um, algorithmically constructed echo chambers. We're not operating within a physical public square anymore. We're online and encountering these campaign speeches and um, supporting news stories, et cetera, within our own echo chambers. And so it, it does diminish the opportunity for real counter speech um, in a way that I think could be a possible area for government regulation going forward. Um, but that's a much more structural response to the problem. It doesn't, I think, within American First Amendment jurisprudence, the idea is that um, you wouldn't be able to target one individual hateful speaker. That person has the right to convey his or her message, assuming that it doesn't veer into one of the prohibited or one of the prescribable categories um, under the First Amendment, like obscenity or true threats or real incitement to violence. Um, but that means that there's a heavier burden on government regulators and on the public at large to speak up and explain why these views are hateful, why this person shouldn't be elected, um, and to create an open, open discourse where counter speech is really possible. Let me ask uh, one more question, then we'll go to the audience, and ask it from the opposite perspective, which is recent challenges from the left. And this doesn't necessarily follow, but just as a descriptive matter, it seems one can make the argument that um, challenges from the left present a slightly different uh, challenge to free speech. Um, so one answer I'm hearing, especially in the context of my first question, is well, um, uh, to to sometimes you, need, you, you may need to restrict speech to promote greater speech, at least partially in Europe, maybe even the United States. But it seems to me uh, arguments from the left with regard to restricting free speech don't it, it come less from uh, 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 an absolute uh, challenging and absolutist uh, value of free speech, but the left asserts that look, you need to restrict free speech in the name of equality. And I'm thinking of what's going on on a lot of college campuses in particular. Now, that's not necessarily government unless it's state universities, but the idea of trigger warnings, the idea of taking books off the curriculum that might offend. Um, and how does one defend free speech, which is a liberty value, against an assault based on equality? Because the idea is, you know, 
I cannot be a full member of society if I am subject to this speech that is part of an ongoing historical effort to demean people like me. So maybe we'll start with the US on that and then move to Europe. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Just personally, this is one of the issues that I have the most difficulty with. Um, I think I start a little bit by rejecting the dichotomy between the liberty and equality interests in this question. Um, from a kind of Hannah Arendtian <laughs> view of what it means to have the opportunity to speak, there's this basic kind of epistemological difficulty that we all face, which is that we don't know the experiences that we don't have. So we can't step into the shoes of another person and experience their lives and their realities unless um, the only way we can do that is for them to explain it to us. And so on some basic level, I do think that freedom of expression serves the end of achieving greater equality, which is only possible once you are able to fully recognize existing inequalities in society. That said, not everybody comes to the speech party with the same intentions. Um, I think there's a much kind of not maligned case, but there's one case that is written off as a dead letter in First Amendment jurisprudence in the United States. It's called uh, Red Lion, and it deals with the FCC's effort back in the 70s, I believe, to create a kind of parity um, within broadcast networks where if they gave uh, an opportunity for one political candidate to speak, they had to give an equal opportunity for another political candidate to speak. And the, First Am the Supreme Court held that this was acceptable under the First Amendment, that the broadcaster's rights were not being infringed by this requirement. Because if anything, this requirement served the interests of the polity as a whole, of the listener. And those interests were um, equally important under the First Amendment to the speaker interests of the political candidates and the broadcasters themselves. And I think that the First Amendment does create space for regulation that creates a healthier listener environment and public discourse environment overall. Um, it's, not, it's not a one-sided protection that only goes to the people who want to stand up in front of a microphone. And it, it may well be that even though the First Amendment doesn't require um, uh, regulation that suppresses hate speech in the effort to create um, a more open speech environment for people who are denigrated by hate speech, um, or otherwise intimidated by it. Nonetheless, it, it may be possible that the government could step in and take, ref take reform measures that are not, uh, to the extent that they're not directly suppressing the circulation of particular views, but um, go to maximize opportunities for counter speech and to limit actual intimidation that results from hateful speech. Um, I, I think there's a possible compromise within First Amendment doctrine and, um, you know, I think Charlottesville is one example that crops up in this context, too, and it seems to me that a lot of the speech at issue in Charlottesville was actual incitement to violence and was, uh, took the form of a true threat. These would be permissible areas of government regulation consistent with the First Amendment. Yeah. Um, most of you are going to have specific regulation on hate speech. Right. Um, and, and some of it is very strong. Um, it's partly for historical reasons, but it's also based on a f uh, very substantial uh, jurisprudence of, of the courts, and particularly the court in Strasbourg. So to some extent, it's codification of what courts have uh, been uh, uh, working on. Uh, sometimes these laws are being challenged again, and uh, often it is because there have been particularities, short-term interests that one tried to fit into these laws, and has turned out that that's not, very, not a very practical way to work. Uh, also in uh, jurisprudence, national courts, but also the uh, courts in, in, in Strasbourg, and, and again, Luxembourg has very little jurisprudence on these issues because it's a very young court when it comes to fundamental rights, and, and uh, it, it has shown some, some really good, interesting case law in, in privacy, but things like freedom of expression have been outside of the scope. In, in that jurisprudence, you you see that within Europe, and this Europe, the Strasbourg Europe, is the Europe of 50 states, not 27 or 28, that, uh, again, there are very strong traditions that dominate also in how you deal hate with hate, issues like hate speech. And in particular, uh, 
uh, semi-hate speech, where it's about reputation, where it's about vaguer norms, that's where courts become very cautious. So that's where Hungary is one of those examples where also in new laws, issues were mentioned like it needs to be truthful, it needs to be objective, etc. And those are notions that the courts almost always uh, don't like and don't uh, respect. Uh, and, and shows that there is a substantial margin within freedom of speech uh, to exercise freedom of speech. Has, does it have sometimes consequence? Yes, it does. And in, in, with elections, as you maybe know, in France, uh, the French courts came very close to excluding certain uh, members of political parties from uh, exercising their electoral rights uh, because it was really at the edge of is this still, does this still fit within proportionality tests that we consider to be the appropriate way to deal with that. And of course, yes, there is, it, it is important that there is counter speech. It's important that uh, there is independent journalism, but uh, I was also once told that a lot of issues are solved by very mundane solutions like good education, income, stable social environment. And if you are not able to invest in those things, it's, uh, I don't know whether it's an, an English expression, it's, it's carrying water to the sea. So a lot of the things that we are now discussing, in my view, in today's debate have to do with these far more bigger issues dissatisfaction in democracy. Uh, again, people not having a health insurance or having a proper education or having proper income. Uh, it helps you to really avoid a lot of things. Great. Thank you for that. I will open uh, matters to the floor. So any questions? I believe we have a microphone. Hi, I actually have a question um, yes. coming off of what Nico just mentioned about proportionality and um, oh, um, and um, Carrie's earlier point about how far um, we go in the United States to protect speech, no matter how hateful. Um, and in terms of the test that you mentioned about incitement of violence and having this requirement of it being immediate, do you think that that's something that the court should reevaluate in this kind of modern post-Charlottesville environment where, for instance, universities, you know, it's, it's not a doesn't consider like a financial burden of universities having hundreds of thousands of dollars that they might have to pay to allow certain speakers that students have um, brought to campus and sort of other burdens that might justify preventing um, certain speakers or you know limiting um, public forums for speech. Um, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I think the resources that are required to protect um, audience members and counter protesters in these circumstances, it's a very difficult line to draw. How much is enough? Uh, well, really, how much is free speech worth on both sides of the equation? And it's very difficult ex ante in the case of Charlottesville when the protesters were asking for a permit um, to, you know, of course, they're going to make claims that they have no intent to be destructive or incite violence, et cetera. They'll say the right things. And unless you have um, an opposing side, if the city was doing its own independent research online and finding evidence that that might not be the case, you know, that would be a very industrious city that is not likely to, um, you know, that evidence is not likely to be mounted at the a necessary time um, in, in many of these circumstances. I don't have a good answer for how many resources are enough. I think, you know, to the extent, like Boston did it right in my view. Um, I think that's a real example following Charlottesville of a situation where you had a similar set of actors planning to show up and obviously there was much more publicity about it at that point and the, um, the city spent a tremendous amount of resources in creating a kind of safe dual channel protest scene. Um, and I think that was the right decision. That said, I can't, you know, I'm not a university administrator and I, I don't know how to allocate those dollars. In, uh, in European jurisprudence, uh, maintaining public order is one of the exceptions uh, or one of the allowed restrictions. Uh, and I'm very much in favor of keeping that something that finally is up to the courts to decide because it's often a moving target. Uh, what is reasonable 
tremendously depends on circumstances. Um, we see a lot of restraint. Courts are not easily convinced by arguments that are brought forward by municipalities or other institutions. I, I think the university example in the US is, like I said, it's complicated. Uh, but but I, I, I do share the concern because uh, I sometimes, and, and again, this is not reason, but that's, no, it's a little bit of reason. Uh, it's more than just a feeling that I have that, uh, and that comes also to the, your question about the left versus the right, if that exists, but let's assume that that exists, that uh, political correctness is not always the appropriate reaction. Uh, political correctness in both a positive way and a negative way. Uh, I have the impression that uh, in Europe, uh, universities are scared to position themselves or offer opportunities for this kind of debate. And it's not politically correct to have certain opinions being expressed within a university. I think that's why universities should still be a free haven and you're free to express whatever opinion you want. Uh, I, I see that when in Europe you want to involve, uh, for example, people from larger companies. Uh, there's a kind of hesitation to have companies being part of this debate. I'm, I'm, I, I feel more comfortable of, of, of having them in the debate and, and, and challenge also their role in, in this process. Uh, this recent decision by the European Court of Human Rights in the, in the Delphi case is a clear attempt where uh, the, the courts have said we cannot have a black and white situation where we exclude responsibilities and say, well, because you are a hosting organization, you have no liability or responsibility as such. It, it's all about not 50, but 100, 200 shades of gray that you have to take into account. And jurisprudence gives some criteria, but it's also constantly developing those criteria. And this, this is one of the beautiful things of the court in Strasbourg. They have this living instrument theory. So they every time reinterpret uh, uh, their own decisions, uh, take into account new developments. And, and of course, it's, it's partly also muddling through because uh, they have like hundreds of thousands, well maybe it's not hundreds of thousands, but I think they have over 100,000 cases that still have to be taken care of, but that's where they select cases and, and they are also showing more willingness to take cases that are important today and, and come with swifter decisions than uh, like a first come, first, uh, first, come, first out uh, uh, kind of approach. Hi, I'm Mark Conrad. I teach at the Cabelli School. Uh, I'd like to ask Nico a question um, involving procedure as well as substance. Uh, uh, you may be aware that uh, the government of Poland uh, enacted a law the other day that criminalized certain kind of speech that, quote, insulted the Polish nation regarding uh, a role in the Holocaust and the term Polish death camps, uh, punishable by up to three years in jail. The, certainly in the United States, this would be uh, unconstitutional, most likely in about a heartbeat. Uh, would there be a ripeness of a challenge to this law in the European Court of Human Rights, number one, assuming somebody would be prosecuted under it? Two, what do you think, based on EU law, a uh, court could rule or likely to rule? And three, what is the effect of a uh, ruling by that court in the domestic law of a given EU state? Uh, uh, th th this Polish law is uh, definitely showing that Poland is, by European standards, still a young democracy. Uh, and uh, th these things are very emotional in countries like Hungary and Poland. Uh, again, all, all, both countries have also a bigger, uh, a broader context. Uh, uh, Poland has this huge issue with uh, its relationship uh, with Russia and how also in Poland manipulation takes place. This law is completely wrong, without any doubt. It will not survive, at least several aspects will not survive. Uh, court in Strasbourg has been very clear about Holocaust denial. Uh, it has happened, you cannot deny it. Uh, what the Polish have done is make a kind of mirror law and say, uh, you cannot say that Poland played a role in the Holocaust. That's how I translate this uh, provision about you cannot talk about the Polish camps 
there is pure evidence. This, this is where Poland has still a very important underlying problem with discrimination of particular groups and particular religions. And uh, uh, at the same time, um, when the European Union made very clear statements about it by its vice president, Mr. Timmermans, who is a Dutch person and who is very, very much into defending fundamental rights and, and the rule of law, the first argument, one of the first arguments that the Polish made, uh, because as you know, this is not one law. There is also this, uh, these new rules about the nomination of the members of the Supreme Court in Poland, which has become more political. The first argument he made to Mr. Timmermans is he said, well, you're from the Netherlands. You don't even have a Supreme Court, <coughs> which is unfortunately entirely true. Uh, we totally rely on the court in Strasbourg. Um, because in the Dutch constitution, it says that international treaties are binding and also decisions by international courts are directly binding if they are self-executing. So the decisions of the court in Strasbourg, also the whole portfolio of the fundamental rights of uh, uh, Strasbourg is considered to be part of the Dutch system. In other countries, the constitution uh, obliges you to first translate them into national law, but we have this uh, monolithic system where automatically they apply. The, uh, and that brings me to the question of the courts. So first of all, answer to the Polish, my, my, the Polish laws. My impression is, I'm, I'm totally sure that if this goes to Strasbourg, Strasbourg will annul or will say this is an infringement of uh, free speech, but also maybe from other provisions in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, European Convention of, of Human Rights. And, and, and what they are doing is not much different from what the Turks have been doing also recently, enforcing these kind of very vague uh, provisions in law and mainly to uh, limit free political speech than uh, to say this is about a, 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 a real problem. You, you were also mentioning uh, Luxembourg and, and, and that's, that's where maybe uh, it's important to stress again we have two European courts. The court in Luxembourg that deals with EU matters, the European Union, and we have the court in Strasbourg that deals with matters that concern the members of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe has roughly eight, I mentioned that before, 48 members, the European Union has 27. Fundamental rights are very, very new in uh, an EU context, at least the enforceability of fundamental rights. This charter of fundamental rights uh, only became a uh, official instrument in 1999, uh, uh, 19, in 2009, so, so that's like six, seven years ago, so it's very, very recent. And only now first cases have been brought to Strasbourg and uh, to Luxembourg, and in particular cases concerning uh, uh, privacy got a lot of attention because the court showed that, it's, uh, f that it has very strong opinions on fundamental rights. Extremely strong opinions because you, it depends a bit on how you want to interpret these cases, but for example, twice the court has annulled instruments of primary law, a, a, a European directive, and a decision by the European uh, uh, Commission. And when courts annul legislation in, in, in Europe, keeping in mind the separation of powers, it's very, very rare that courts annul instruments of primary law. It basically means that a court says, European Parliament, you were wrong. European Council, you were wrong. European Commission, you were wrong. Member States, you were wrong when you implemented these European decisions. And, and, and that also, to some extent, explains the crisis that we have in Europe about uh, citizens trusting the European Union, because the European Union, for a very long time, only had this top-bottom approach. They were meant to standardize and to harmonize, and uh, that works only to a certain extent. When it, it's purely about economic issues, people would probably less care, but when it comes to things that are directly involving the way they live, the way they conduct, then a bottom-up approach seems to be much more appropriate. And that's what the court in Strasbourg is more about. So there is a lot of margin of appreciation for the member states, but if a vast majority of the member states has a particular idea about how to interpret fundamental rights, then the court says, but we also do have a standing practice in Europe, and only if you and if you deviate from this standing practice, you need to have additional arguments. Very simple example: Austria was the only country in Europe 
that uh, didn't allow for other broadcasting than, than public broadcasting, and the court said, well, wait a minute, if you're the only country, you have to have additional arguments. They didn't have any additional arguments, so it was no longer allowed to have a, uh, a monopoly of public broadcasting in Austria. It's a dynamic process, and uh, so th th I expect, again, this Polish law not to survive, as we will probably have very soon also the challenge of uh, the Hungarian uh, legislation. Uh, let me stick with that. Uh, so my question is, what do we do when speech crosses borders and there are sovereignty issues? I'm thinking particularly of the EU right to be forgotten and how there have been issues with um, like trying to apply it in servers in the U.S. and with U.S. companies. In fact, I think there's a, a follow-up case pending in Luxembourg on that. On the yeah. Scope. yeah. I'll let you take the first one. Okay. 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 Uh, you saw on my slides GDPR. I didn't mention it in my presentation. Uh, GDPR is the, uh, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, the 25th of May uh, this year, the world is going to change. Probably we'll wake up the next day and nothing has changed, but nevertheless. Um, yeah, there is some concern about whether privacy or data protection uh, is going to interfere with uh, freedom of expression. And one of the decisions of the court in Luxembourg also uh, seems for some to indicate that the court sees privacy as more important than freedom of expression. Uh, the GDPR has some exceptions for freedom of expression, but this is where then you ask, uh, and this is a hammer and nail uh, issue, that, that's why you ask privacy authorities to discuss freedom of expression. Privacy authorities who have only one hammer, that's more privacy, and see everything as a privacy issue. So I don't think that's really going to help. Uh, the right to be forgotten is, includes the right to forget about the right to be forgotten. <laughs> the, it's, a it's, again, a complicated issue. In, um, in the previous session, we were talking about uh, market dominance and uh, competition law and, and how to use that and how, and how to use antitrust. I think that uh, the way the right to be forgotten now has been interpreted uh, has created a monster because uh, market players introduced a system of formalities which is so complicated and so expensive that probably nobody else can uh, comply with the same system. So that, that's where I think it helped to close the market instead to open the market. Uh, and this is also where, when I make this, uh, when I say we already have a lot of instruments that we can use, I think the right to be forgotten needs to be matched with ordinary duties of care and needs to match, for example, with uh, also general principles in law that say if you can find a lesser solution to solve a problem then you should take the lesser solution. One of the cases now pending in Luxembourg is the case made by the French regulator that the right to be forgotten has uh, unlimited extraterritoriality. So the uh, particular decision in this Costeja case should now be uh, enforceable all over the world. This is one of the most stupid arguments you can make because extraterritoriality has a very, very important downside, reciprocity. It means that any other country can claim the same thing. We, we made this uh, point uh, very explicitly in an amicus brief to the US Supreme Court in the Microsoft Island case. Be extremely careful to make things extraterritorial because it will, uh, come, it will haunt you for the rest of your life. Why is this so important to make this reference to general principles in law? Because what are we talking about in this particular case? We are talking about a small ad in a local newspaper by a local government about a situation where a guy uh, more or less went bankrupt and his, his, his properties were being sold. This has nothing to do with freedom of speech. If, if you have a principle of don't harm unnecessarily, this local newspaper could just have killed this ad or make it no longer available on the internet and we now, and we would have had no problem with it. So this right to be forgotten 
is, in my view, totally overstated, but does that mean that you can use information about people, about things that happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago in faith to damage them? No. That's where we also have principles in tort law, that you should not unnecessarily uh, damage people and use uh, old information again and again where it has lost its validity. As we do that with criminal records, although uh, there is a big difference between some countries what you can do with criminal records and what you can't do with criminal records, but you have already a very strong right to be forgotten when it comes to criminal records in most countries of the world. I think the sovereignty question also goes to the code of conduct that the social media companies signed on, signed on to with respect to taking down hate speech when notified. Um, there have been some indications that the companies have now have been circulating um, hash identifiers, basically the identities of the accounts that have been subject to takedowns. and. Uh, creating a blacklist. So it's not just within the particular country that requests the takedown of something that's unlawful hate, sp hate speech within that country, but across the, plat the inter um, across the internet, basically. Um, and so you, you do see the impact of EU countries, hate speech laws in the United States speech um, environment. And you know, I mean, qu query whether or not that's um, <laughs> a healthy development in the U.S. speech environment or an unhealthy one, but it is limiting the opportunity of certain voices to be heard within the United States on a ground that would not be permissible for the United States to require in and of itself. And actually, I want to query whether that is problematic from a First Amendment point <laughs> of view, because if it's not, if the action is no longer government, but the real regulator of free speech is Google, Facebook, Twitter, and they are um, uh, banning hate speech that would otherwise be permitted, that government couldn't ban, but who cares about government's power because the real power is with private companies. And really, even the same question in Europe, what if the companies are, quote unquote, overprotecting, you know, uh, and uh, even from the European perspective, banning more hate speech than the European Union or European governments would allow. Is that a problem? Um. Well, I think, I mean, I don't know if many of you saw the Times article about Facebook's approach to hate speech, and if you take a quiz trying to guess what would be um, hate speech subject to a takedown under Facebook's terms of use, um, I, I failed <laughs> miserably <laughs> that quiz. Um, I think there was some, some question on an internal guidance document within Facebook about whether or not uh, a post referencing um, black children, a post referencing um, a woman worker, and a post referencing white men, which among those might be subject to a hate speech takedown, and only the last category would be subject to a hate speech takedown um, because it's discriminating both, both on the basis of, um, of race and of sex. And so there, I think, these platforms, hate speech codes, are wildly over and under inclusive. And there's also evidence that they're being used against minority speakers more than against um, you know, white supremacists, for example. So I, I do think that we should be a little bit concerned about the power that these companies have when it comes to regulating the speech environment that we conduct our, I mean, basically exclusively conduct our public discourse on. That said, um, it's not, I, I don't think we should necessarily constitutionalize the actions of these private companies. We can't really because of the state action doctrine, but the public has the ability to put an enormous amount of pressure on these companies. Um, you know, it's limited by the fact that they are a mega duopoly, as was referenced before, so there aren't a lot of alternatives. Um, and it would be great if there were competing social media platforms that had competing codes of conduct and competing transparency, uh, commitments that you know people could move from Facebook to something that aligns more with their views but um, I don't know I guess this is where I kind of come into alignment with Sally that antitrust might be a good way to address that problem more so than the First Amendment um, when company behavior is actually because governments otherwise threaten them to regulate, so there is the chilling effect. The chilling effect has been recognized in jurisprudence. Right. So, so that could play an important role. These, there is also the fact that uh, 
Uh, there is a kind of indirect harmonization effect when you have this behavior where you say, we now block it all over Europe or we have a, an opinion on particular content. Uh, because in Europe you have differences. And, and not to talk about na uh, hate speech, but give another sensitive topic, nudity. There's a clear difference between ideas about nudity in the UK and in France, <laughs> for example. Uh, so if we want to have diversity, then we should not have indirect harmonization because there is a kind of overarching threat in, uh, in, in this particular uh, situation. Jurisprudence also gives huge autonomy to media and to everyone who is involved in this value chain because sometimes there are discussions about is Facebook part of this or not uh, or Google. I think the jurisprudence of the court has a functional approach. It's about who exercises a role in the whole process of freedom of expression and uh, we are not bound by uh, definitions of the European Union who tries to define caching and hosting in a technical way when we look at fundamental rights. Uh, that's a totally different chapter. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of EU lawyers have no knowledge about fundamental rights, so they, they are experts in providing total fake news about how Europe thinks. Maybe I'm doing that also, by the way. But, but uh, so there is, there, is, there is clear jurisprudence that says there, there are responsibilities. And this is also where duties of care kick in, which are not only public duties of care, but they are also civil code duties of cares. And, and just let me throw something else on the table. If you know that your data can be uh, 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 asked for by governments and national security agencies under total legal statutes, what is then your duty of care? Do you have a separate duty of care to say, wait a minute, uh, maybe it's not in the interest of my users that their data might in the future being exposed to oversight? Um, and that's where, again, we have to learn that it's not a one-side street when you talk about obligations and rights. Uh, and, and I see that a lot of young companies still have to learn how to deal with these issues, and all the companies have been able to do that much better. Uh, and uh, that's why we also should not be too quick to say we need new legislation because we base the legislation on the situation of today, and maybe in four years' time, six years' time, the situation might be much more different and we might end up again with square wheels uh, that will not help us. So actually, so let me take the opportunity, I think we have time for one more question and unless I hear anyone else, I'll ask it, which is um, for both of you, but primarily for Terry, uh, and it's really to double down on the lefty challenge, right? So. The argument would go something like this. I've heard it from Harold Coe and others, that you know, one reason that Europe is historically, and international law has historically been far more open to the regulation of hate speech, you know, is historical experience. You see what, hap what uh, the result of permitting hate speech was in Europe in the 20s and 30s. Um, it's easy for the United States to be absolutist. Uh, on that point because we haven't experienced the same thing. And so that's one reason the United States is an outlier. Well, that's my question, right? That's the challenge because the challenge is twofold. One is looking forward and looking backward. Looking forward, there is this worry that precisely what has started to happen in Europe in the 20s is starting to happen here with the scapegoating of religious minorities, with, the scape with white supremacy, etc. Uh, and looking backward, um, uh, this is where critical race theory comes in. Um, it has happened in the United States, we just haven't appreciated it with regard to speech that is hateful towards African Americans, which perpetuates slavery, uh, <coughs> racial subordination. So with all of that, shouldn't it be the case that the United States moves closer to Europe, at least with regard to the application of strict scrutiny, if nothing else, that the courts should uh, be willing to uh, um, take more seriously uh, governmental interests uh, that are concerned about subordination of racial and other groups. So that's the challenge to a First Amendment absolutist <laughs> position. Yeah, well, I guess I will confess that I am not necessarily a First Amendment absolutist, uh -huh. um, and I'm sympathetic to the view that there are incredibly weighty government interests in establishing a baseline equality and recognition of civic dignity in all of the members of our society. 
um, that may override uh, First Amendment interest of a speaker in a particular instance. Um, I am speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the Knight Institute in this regard, but um, I, think, I think the difficulty in American, not only jurisprudence, but democratic theory is this concept that I referred to earlier about the premise of our democracy being the ability of its constituents to challenge the incumbent government and express whatever view they may have on the direction the country should take. And then the rest of the country can internalize that view, um, reject it if they want, but embrace it if they want, and um, give effect to it in the voting booth. And uh, I think this is where you see the, some very stark contrasts between what would be permissible in the United States and what countries like Germany are doing. Um, I think BuzzFeed actually recently had an article about um, some data analysis they did of withholdings on Twitter, which is when Twitter uh, withholds an account from the platform based on a request from a foreign government. And they looked at accounts that had been withheld um, across the world, really, but noted that there had been a sharp spike in withholding requests from Germany and, and Turkey as well, but from Germany surrounding elections. And this uh, trend, I think, speaks to, again, kind of the fundamental difference that you pointed out, that in Europe, given historical experience, there's a real concern that hateful speech will have an effect uh, at the polls and give rise to a government that you know, th that through demo democratic channels um, elects a very undemocratic government. Um, within <laughs> the US experience, though, I think it was Justice Holmes who said basically that the First Amendment protects the right of people to advocate um, a government that would be ultimately our undoing as a democratic uh, republic. And I, I struggle with that. <laughs> I don't know that I have an answer for you. I do think that there should be more room within First Amendment jurisprudence for a holistic view of a healthy public debate, an inclusive public debate um, that gives uh, a more sure footing to the democracy that we end up with than one that still has the vestiges of past discrimination and um, reflects the unequal speaking opportunities that people have in this country. Yeah, this is this is where really this living instrument theory kicks in. So, so what the definition of hate speech was maybe 50, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. is not uh, the only definition that that is being used today. And and that's where we will hope we will see that the development is that we have a broader perspective on what kind of limitations are than the specific limitations that we do allow. But. Uh, with hate speech, it's quite clear that the developments in Poland and in Hungary and in some other countries show that other types of hate speech are now becoming more prominent. Uh, and and, and I, I'm, I'm totally confident that in, in Strasbourg, this functional approach will show that also these other types of speech can fall within the limitations of what used to be called traditional hate speech. Great. Well, on that hopeful note, let me invite you to thank our panelists.